Let us stand together and pass the peace that we have with Jesus Christ with one another. Ushers, come forward. We'll receive our offering.
our God, we give you thanks for these gifts, the opportunity to share with our resources, with the resources of your kingdom. Take and use these gifts for the building up of believers, for evangelizing those who need to know you. Watch over these gifts and use them and bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Everyone may be seated. Our scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 to 31. If you would like to follow along, it is on page 1081 in the Bible ahead of you. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 25 through 31. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Again, take your hymnal, chart to number 160. 160. The tune is familiar, the text may not be, but it fits again, our following of the Easter season, the day of resurrection, number 160. You may be seated while we sing for our room to stand. <laughs>
The reading from the Gospel is from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Thank you very much for reading for us, Stu. Appreciate it. Hey, how's your week been? Good? We had a great Sunday last Sunday, didn't we, at, for Easter? And then we've had incredible weather this week. I imagine some of you are really impressed with your golf scores and your croquet scores. You know, so. And then you had family to come and visit. Many of you had family and friends visit. And now you're resting up from that. That wasn't as funny as I thought. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, listen, here's what we have today. I've, I've talked about this passage from Luke uh, many times. This is kind of the week after Easter when we look at that passage. There's so much happening on Easter that we take this dramatic scene from Luke, usually the week afterwards, but it's really Easter afternoon. And as two people are walking along from Jerusalem to Emmaus, it's a distance of about seven miles. So to give you an idea, that would be like walking into Stewart or walking from here down to Hobe Sound Beach. That would be about how far it is uh, to go to this little town that's outside of Jerusalem. It's it, it's no longer called Emmaus there. It's uh, the closest thing that we have is a little town called El Kebeba. And uh, these important characters are part of the gospel story because Luke is telling us how 
two additional witnesses are confirming the appearance of Jesus as he rose from the dead. I like this story because these two witnesses that are walking along, these two disciples, we don't, we never heard of them before. Uh, one of them is named Cleopas. That's kind of a nickname, a Greek nickname, and Luke is writing to Greek people. So it's a shortened form, kind of a nickname for the word, for the name Cleopatros, uh, a guy's name. And I'm curious why the other disciple is not named. I, I don't have a, a, a perfect solution, but as I think about this path that they're walking along, which is really just a dirt road, there are no paved roads going out of Jerusalem in the first century. They're walking along, and I, I just wonder if it wasn't uh, his wife that it was a husband and wife, because they were talking along the way. You know how husbands and wives, they, they talk about things. They, one says one thing, and the other says the other, and it's back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And that's the discussion going on uh, for seven miles. Oh, my goodness, it's weary. You know, well, about four miles in or so, Jesus suddenly appears to them. He appears as kind of a stranger, and he says, hey guys, what, what are you talking about? And they stop short, and they say, wait, are you the only guy that doesn't know what just went on in Jerusalem this weekend? And he says, well, what things? And he lets them tell the story of what they knew. It sounds like this couple, now it could be two guys, so don't, uh, don't assume anything here, but just these two people, they had gone through the Passover weekend, they saw Jesus die, was buried, and then on Sunday morning, they see that the tomb is empty. That's, that's kind of where they said, well, you know, I think, I think it's time for us to go home. That's all they have, that's what we know from the text. And so as they tell the story, as you follow along in the text, they get to the point that, well, the women, they went to the tomb and they saw he was gone. And so did the other disciples. They, they conclude he's gone. And Jesus said, whoa, 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 whoa. You slow of heart to understand the scriptures. And that's when Jesus starts, he starts getting into his mode of teaching. And he t starts telling them, Everything in the scriptures from Moses and the prophets concerning himself. Wow, wouldn't you have liked to have been a part of that conversation? To hear from Moses and the prophets. You know, later on, if you want to take a look at some of those passages that Jesus probably would have quoted, look at Isaiah chapter 9, look at Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah 11, also Isaiah 53, and you will see from those chapters very clear things about the prophecies concerning Jesus' death, his suffering, and his resurrection. And the key that Jesus is trying to say to them is that, look, you're all upset because Jesus has died, he was buried, and now his tomb is empty. But what you're upset about has been planned from the beginning of time. This was all part of God's plan. There is something eternal going on. Luke is a masterful storyteller. I like Luke because he picks up on people's identity. He, as you look through the Gospel of Luke, as well as Acts, he wrote the book of Acts as well, he finds individuals and he starts telling little stories, character development stories. He's always finding someone who was nameless, and then he gives them a name and focuses on their journey. As Jesus is telling them all these things, they're totally astounded. Like, well, gee, I didn't know that. I, I didn't realize that. And, and as they are going in this conversation, they suddenly get home. And Cleopas and the other follower says, hey, look, it's getting about sunset. Why don't you come on in? That would be a Jewish tradition of hospitality to welcome them in and say, come on in. Let's have a little bread 
and let's, let's eat a little something. So Jesus goes into the room where they are having a little food. According to Jewish traditions, generally when you begin a Jewish meal, one of the things that happens is there's a little hand washing ritual that they do. They say a blessing, right? And they uh, say, blessed be the Lord God, king of the universe, who has commanded us in the washing of hands. So Jesus is washing his hands with them. And then there's a funny thing in the text there that says, as he was taking the bread in his hands, which also happens at the beginning of a meal, if you've ever been a part of a Seder meal or a Jewish meal at home, one of the first things that they do before serving the meal is they take a little bit of bread and they say, blessed be the Lord God, the king of the universe, who has given us bread from the earth. Now, I want you to slow down, because sometimes what happens when we read this passage, we're reading for information and we just gloss over stuff. But if, let's slow it down for a second. We're at the table. Jesus is talking. The people are talking. They wash the hands. They say the blessing. They take, Jesus takes the bread in his hands. Suddenly, it says their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Now, I'm, I'm pausing and I'm using silence for the effect, not to help you sleep a little better this morning, but, but really to just say, take a moment and imagine being here at that moment at that table. Jesus takes the bread. Try to imagine him picking up the bread from the table holding it up, and breaking the bread. Now, all it says is that he took the bread and blessed it, and he gave it to them, and suddenly their eyes were opened. What do you think was the sudden shock that they had not, that had not occurred? This is something that I've read this text for many, many years, and it wasn't until this week I said, I dropped my jaw. Imagine, go ahead, imagine you have bread in your hands. Go ahead, go like this. You have bread in your hands. Now break it, okay? And look at your hands. What was different about Jesus' hands than your hands? And when they saw something, they said, whoa, whoa. And they were amazed. Their eyes were opened. They recognized him. And at that moment, he became invisible. And they said to us, honey, did you get heartburn like I did? The Christian heartburn? Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us? And it says within the hour or at that moment, they got up and left and they went back to Jerusalem. Now, I know we're over 55. Imagine just walking seven miles all the way into Stewart, having a bite of bread with Jesus, and being so amazed and so astounded, you walk back. That's, that's 14 miles that day that you walked. That's a long way. But they couldn't keep this truth to themselves. They had to tell someone. They were literally amazed. You know what that word amazement means? Everyone in the world is walking through a maze. They can't see, they just see what's right ahead of them. They're turning right, turn left, hit a wall, go back, turn right, turn left, and they're walking through a maze of life. They can't see the whole picture because they're just walking a path, trying to figure life out, and then something happens where they're lifted out of the maze of life and they finally see the big picture and the end where they're supposed to go. That is amazing. That's what it means. It's a, 
It's a verb that means, or a, an adjective that means you're no longer in the maze. They had figured it out in just a moment. And so they went to go tell the disciples. They went back. Isaiah talks about how God is everlasting. He says, what can you compare me to, he says in Isaiah. He is the everlasting God. He is the eternal God. He is the God who can lift you out of all your troubles. He is the God who understands everything. And whatever you may be going through, God understands. And this Jesus is God in the human body. He understands the disciples' perplexity. But then when he reveals to them the scriptures, they're amazed. And they're totally changed. They got power and strength for a whole other journey. Because in Isaiah, it says he gives power to the weak. He gives strength to the powerless. He gives you power and strength for every day's challenges. It was Easter that day, but it really was just one moment in eternity because Easter goes from a moment where you are forgiven of all your sin and you are given everlasting life and it continues on for the rest of your life. Jesus said to these disciples, look, this is not a new idea. This has been going on since the beginning of time. Welcome to everlasting life. It is God's plan from the very beginning to the very end of time to love you, to watch over you, to give you grace for each day's journey. Today, we're going to celebrate communion. You notice that we only serve bread and wine. We don't do a whole meal here. And I'm just, I'm just scratching my head at this, but I'm just thinking, I wonder if it has anything to do with that meal in Emmaus where they didn't have a full meal there either. They got to the bread when they realized, hey, this is Jesus. He disappears from their sight. And then they take off. They don't finish the meal. Perhaps as we take communion today, perhaps we can remember Jesus is right here present with us too. And that is enough to know that his presence is with us. And then we leave here with the power and strength that he gives to tell good news. When we connect Christ with the story of the ages in the Old Testament, the link is this. Through all the accounts, through the patriarchs, from Sinai, through the prophets, to Christ, who not only loved God's law perfectly and fulfilled the law for us, he showed us the depth of his love, and he showed us the fulfillment of all those laws. He showed us redemption. He showed us God's presence, God's love, God's faithfulness, God's grace, God's judgment. And he gave a whole new identity to God's people. You are no longer slaves to sin, but you have been freed from that power. And you now walk in the newness of life. Today, as we celebrate communion, may you also feel God's presence in the breaking and the participating of the meal. The breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. This is for everyone who trusts in Jesus as Lord. That's what our communion is for. It's open communion. From every passage of the Old Testament, it usually gets you on a road that leads you somewhere to Jesus. Jesus' love, his death, his suffering, his resurrection, his power, and the Holy Spirit's filling in you. Today, as you worship today, remember that Christ came to save you from sin. He came to dwell with you, to give you a whole new eternity. This is a road, Emmaus Road. I don't know where it begins and I don't know where it ends, but I know one thing, that this Easter road called the Emmaus Road is a road that goes on around the world for all eternity.